Welcome to the Hackberry House of Chosun, sermonaudio.com. My name is Bob. We're taking a little break from our normal Bible study and uh, cult study. wanted to get into some of the great men of God. I uh, need a little refreshment myself, and maybe this will refresh you too. I'm reading from the Free Grace Broadcaster, a ministry of Mount Zion Bible Church in Pensacola, Florida. You can actually access them by going on your email to chapel at mountzion.org. Website's at www.chapellibrary, all one word, dot org. Um, they've put together a little collection of some of these Puritans and other men of God who uh, spoke with such wisdom I want to share with you. Here's A.W. Pink who lived from 1886 to 1952. We'll start with him. This is called Tried by Fire. And it's uh, this whole section, this whole booklet, this fall of 2011 that was handed to me just recently is about comfort in affliction. 2 Corinthians 4.17 For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. From Job 23.10 But he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Now Job here corrects himself. In the beginning of the chapter, we find him saying, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Poor Job felt that his lot was unbearable, but he recovers himself. He checks his hasty outburst and revises his impetuous decision. How often we all have to correct ourselves. Only one has ever walked this earth who never had occasion to do so. Also, Job here comforts himself. He could not fathom the mysteries of providence, but God knew the way he took Job had diligently sought the calming presence of God, but for a time in vain. He said, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. That's chapter 23, verses 8 and 9. But he consoled himself with this blessed fact, Though I cannot see God, what is a thousand times better? He can see me. He knoweth. The one above is neither unmindful nor indifferent to our lot. If he notices the fall of a sparrow, if he counts the hairs of our heads, of course he knows the way that I take. Job here enunciates a noble view of life. How splendidly optimistic he was. He did not allow his afflictions to turn him into a skeptic. He did not permit the sore trials and troubles through which he was passing to overwhelm him. He looked at the bright side of the dark cloud, God's side, hidden from sense and reason. He took a long view of life, he looked beyond the immediate fiery trials and said that the outcome would be gold refined. But he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Three great truths are expressed here. Let's briefly consider each separately. First, divine knowledge of my life. He knoweth the way that I take. The omniscience of God is one of the wondrous attributes of deity. For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. Job 34.21 The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Proverbs 15.3 Spurgeon said one of the greatest texts of experimental religion is, What is my relationship to God's omniscience? What is your relationship to it, dear reader, listener? How does it affect you? Does it distress or comfort you? 
Do you shrink from the thought of God knowing all about your way, uh, perhaps your way being a lying, selfish, hypocritical way? To the sinner, this is a terrible thought. He denies it, or if not, he seeks to forget it. But to the Christian, here is real comfort. How cheering to remember that my Father knows all about my trials, my difficulties, my sorrows, and my efforts to glorify Him. Precious truth for those in Christ, harrowing thought for all out of Christ, that the way I am taking is fully known to and observed by God. He knoweth the way that I take. Men did not know the way that Job took. He was grievously misunderstood, and for one with a sensitive temperament, to be misunderstood was a sore trial. His very friends thought he was a hypocrite. They believed he was a great sinner and being punished by God. Job knew that he was an unworthy saint, but not a hypocrite. He appealed against their censorious verdict. He knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Here is instruction for us when we are like circumstanced. Fellow believers, your fellow men, yes, and your fellow Christians may misunderstand you and misrepresent God's dealing with you, but console yourself with the blessed fact that the omniscient one knoweth. He knoweth the way that I take. In the fullest sense of the word, Job himself did not know the way that he took, nor do any of us. Life is profoundly mysterious, and the passing of the years offers no solution. Nor does philosophizing help us. Human volition is a strange enigma. Consciousness bears witness that we are more than automatons. We exercise the power of choice in every move we make. And yet, it's plain that our freedom is not absolute. There are forces brought to bear upon us, both good and evil, which are beyond our power to resist. Both heredity and environment exercise powerful influences upon us. Our surroundings and circumstances are factors that cannot be ignored. And what of providence that shapes our destinies? Ah, how little do we know the way that we take. Said the prophet, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Jeremiah 10.23 Here we enter the realm of mystery, and it's idle to deny it. Better far to acknowledge with the wise man, man's goings are of the Lord. And how can a man then understand his own way? Proverbs 20.24 20, in the narrower sense of the term, Job did know the way that he took. What that way was, he tells us in the next two verses, My foot hath held his steps, his way have I kept and not declined, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job 23, verses 11 and 12. The way Job chose was the best way. The scriptural way, God's way, His way. What do you think of that way, dear listener? Wasn't it a grand selection? Uh, not only patient, but wise, Job. Have you made a similar choice? Can you say, My foot hath held His steps, His way have I kept and not declined? If you can, praise Him for His enabling grace. If you cannot, Confess with shame your failure to appropriate his all-sufficient grace. Get down on your knees at once and unbosom yourself to God. Hide and keep back nothing. Remember, it is written, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, nine. Doesn't verse 12 explain your failure, my failure, dear reader? And listener, isn't it because we have not trembled before God's commandments and because we have so lightly esteemed his word that we have declined from his way? Then let us, even now and daily, 
seek grace from on high to heed his commandments and hide his word in our hearts. He knoweth the way that I take. Which way are you taking? The narrow way that leads to life or the broad road that leads to destruction? Make certain on this point, dear friend. Scripture declares, so every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Romans 14, 12. But you need not be deceived or uncertain. The Lord declared, I am the way. John 14, 6. Well, secondly, divine testing. When he hath tried me. The fining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. Proverbs 17, 3. This was God's way with Israel of old. And it's his way with Christians now. Just before Israel entered Canaan, as Moses reviewed their history since leaving Egypt, he said, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. Deuteronomy 8.2 In the same way, God tries, tests, proves and humbles us. When he hath tried me, if we realized this more, we should bear up better in the hour of affliction and be more patient under suffering. The daily irritations of life, the things that annoy so much, what is their meaning? Why are they permitted? Here's the answer. God is trying you. That's the explanation, in part at least, of that disappointment, that crushing of your earthly hopes, that great loss. God was and is testing you. God's trying your temper, your courage, your faith, your patience, your love, your fidelity. When he hath tried me, how frequently God's saints see only Satan as the cause of their troubles. They regard the great enemy as responsible for much of their suffering, but there's no comfort for the heart in this. We don't deny the devil does bring about much that harasses us, but above Satan is the Lord Almighty. The devil cannot touch a hair of our heads without God's permission, and when he is allowed to disturb and distract us, even then, it is only God using him to try us. Let's learn then to look beyond all secondary causes and instruments to that one who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. That's what Job did. In the opening chapter of the book that bears Job's name, we find Satan obtaining permission to afflict God's servant. He used the Sabaeans to destroy God's, uh, Job's herds. He sent the Chaldeans to slay his servants, caused a great wind to kill his children. What was Job's response? The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job looked beyond the human agents, beyond Satan who employed them, to the Lord who controlleth all. He realized that it was the Lord trying him. We get the same thing in the New Testament. To the suffering saints at Smyrna, John wrote, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. That you may be tried. You see, they're being cast into prison was simply God trying them. How much we lose by forgetting this. What a stay for the trouble-tossed heart to know that no matter what form the testing may take, no matter what the agent that annoys, it is God who is trying his children. What a perfect example the Savior sets us. When he was approached in the garden and Peter drew his sword and cut off the ear of Malchus, the Savior said, The cup which my father has given me, Shall I not drink it? Men were about to vent their awful rage upon him. The serpent was going to bruise his heel, but he looks above and beyond them. Dear listener, no matter how bitter its contents, infinitely less than that which the Savior drained, let's accept the cup as from the Father's hand. In some moods we're apt to question the wisdom and right of God to try us. So often we murmur at his dispensations. Why should God lay such an intolerable burden upon me, we say? And why should others be spared their loved ones and mine taken? Why should health and strength 
perhaps the gift of sight be denied me. The first answer to all such questions is, O man, who are you to reply against God? It is wicked insubordination for any creature to call into question the dealings of the great Creator. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why have you made me thus? How earnestly each of us needs to cry to God that his grace may silence our rebellious lips and still the tempest within our desperately wicked hearts. And by the way, I've got to stop right here and tell you that although Arthur Pink here is telling the truth, absolutely, it doesn't rule out the possibility of you praying. And part of the test could be for you, will you call upon the name of the Lord and be healed, be saved from this thing? And God heals people. God delivers people out of these things. But he's talking to the people here who don't get delivered right away, who want it with all their heart, but they, they just can't get it. Though They pray and cry. 1 Peter 4, 12, 13. We're told, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. The same thoughts are expressed here as in the previous passage. There is a needs be for our trials, and therefore we're to think them not strange. We should expect them. And two, there is again the blessed outlook of being richly recompensed at Christ's return. Then there's the added word that not only should we meet these trials with faith's fortitude, but we should rejoice in them. We're talking about the sufferings of Christ. Inasmuch as we are permitted to have fellowship in those sufferings, he too suffered. Sufficient then for the disciple to be as his master. When he hath tried me, dear Christian listener, there are no exceptions. God had only one son without sin, but never one without sorrow. Sooner or later, in one form or another, trial, and it may be heavy, will be our lot. Uh, from First Thessalonians, And send Timothy, our brother, to establish you, I sent him, Paul said, to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Again, it is written, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. It's been so in every age. Abram was tried, tried severely. So too were Joseph, Jacob, Moses, David, Daniel, the apostles. Three, the ultimate issue. I shall come forth as gold. Observe the tense here. Job didn't imagine that he was pure gold already. I shall come forth as gold, he declared. He knew full well that there was yet much dross in him. He didn't boast that he was already perfect. Far from it. In the final chapter of his book, we find him saying, I abhor myself. And well he might. And may, well may we, as we discover that in our flesh there dwelleth no good thing. As we examine ourselves and our ways in the light of God's word and behold our innumerable failures as we think of our countless sins, both of omission and commission, good reason have we for abhorring ourselves. Ah, Christian listener, there's much dross about us, but it will not ever be thus. I shall come forth as gold. Job did not say, when he hath tried me, I may come forth as gold, or I hope to come forth as gold. But with full confidence and positive assurance, he declared, I shall come forth as gold. But how did he know this? How can we be sure of the happy issue? Because the divine purpose cannot fail. He that has begun a good work in us will finish it. How can we be sure of the happy issue? Because the divine promise is sure. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Psalm 138.8 Then be of good cheer, tried and troubled one. The process may be unpleasant and painful. But the issue is charming and sure. I shall come forth as gold. Now, this was said by one who knew affliction and sorrow, as few among the sons of men have known them. Yet despite his fiery trials, he was optimistic. 
Let then this triumphant language be ours. I shall come forth as gold. It is not the language of carnal boasting, but the confidence of one whose mind was stayed upon God. There will be no credit to our account. The glory will all belong to the divine refiner, James 1.12. For the present, there remain two things. First, love is the divine thermometer while we are in the crucible of testing. And he shall sit in the patience of divine grace as a refiner and purifier of silver. Malachi 3.3. 3. Second, the Lord himself is with us in the fiery furnace as he was with the three young Hebrews. Daniel 3.25. For the future, this is sure. The most wonderful thing in heaven will not be the golden street or the golden harps, but golden souls on which is stamped the image of God, predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. Romans 8.29. Praise God for such a glorious prospect, such a victorious issue, such a marvelous goal. Hmm. That book, uh, that message came from a book called Comfort for Christians, uh, which you can order from the chapel library that I'm reading from. A.W. Pink was a pastor, itinerant Bible teacher, author of studies in the scriptures and many books, Born in Nottingham, England, immigrant to the U.S. and later returned to his homeland, 1934. Thought you might want to know that. Maybe not. Well, wow. I, I'm, I'm glad to be uh, reading other people's works. It's so encouraging. A.W. Pink. He was a he was quite a quite a guy. Quite a uh, classic in terms of his writings and his studies. We'll have more of this by God's grace. Check in from time to time at the website. See what's going here. on here. This is the Hackberry House of Chosun. SermonAudio.com. Lord willing, I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.